Welcome to another episode of Rich in Relationship. And today, the topic is going to be around blended families. We're going to talk about the idea that you're not the people who are supposed to be there. And that's from the point of view of the children in a blended family. And we're going to talk with an expert on this, Debbie Osborne, who has written Raising Other People's Children. She's an attorney and a social worker, and she's got dec decades working with traumatized children. How are you, Debbie? Doing fine. Thank you. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. And you as well. And, you know, the truth is, folks, we've actually been chatting for a little while before we got on this call, but that's how it goes, right? We, we sort of talk it out and figure out where we're going to go and how we're going to fit. And I, I'm adoring you, Debbie. The Thank question you. that I ask Thank everyone you. at the beginning, uh, and you know, folks, this is an important one because Debbie isn't just anyone. Like she is somebody who's put her heart out on her sleeve and she's put her, pardon my language, ass on the line to really help children who are in all kinds of uh, situations, traumatic situations, recovering from painful situations. And you know, to do that, you gotta be passionate. So Debbie, what I wanna ask you is how did your heart lead you to do that work? Well, I grew up with a family that was very involved. My, my parents were involved in youth ministries in the church and did a lot of work with at-risk kids. And both of them worked in the juvenile justice system. And so when I uh, graduated from college, it was a, a natural transition with my experience, having been a, a volunteer with my parents to, uh, to get a job as a, a probation officer in a juvenile court outside Metro Atlanta. Um, unfortunately, I, I burned out after a few years, um, as, as you and I uh, mentioned. I just I got tired of dipping out the ocean with a leaky teaspoon, uh -huh. and uh, so I retreated to law school, but stayed involved uh, with organizations and worked as a volunteer and as a board member and various things. And then, when my um, job career path settled down enough, I uh, started working and, and volunteering as a foster parent. I, I worked, I started out as a, uh, a respite care parent, an emergency placement, and then gradually worked my way into long-term placements. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah I saw, I, you mind if I just no. explore, this, explore with you a little? No, go right ahead. Here's, here's what it is, is that you know what? Plenty of people did stuff with their parents when they were children. And some of them, when they got older, said, oh, thank God, I don't have to do that anymore. But you didn't. So I'm curious, right. what was it about that experience that resonated with you? I think seeing the the kids and the the situations they were in, and then also the, the same experience I had as a social worker, that the kids were the presenting problem, but it was the dysfunctional family that that had put them where they were. And it just sort of left me with a sense of maybe if we can find something to give this child. Um, if, if the analogy I use is that they, they find themselves in a hole and um, some kids will just keep digging. And if we can convince them to stop digging and, and take this ladder that we're throwing down to them, mm -hmm. um, then maybe we can uh, get them out and, and, get them started on functional lives. So I, I just bonded with the kids, I guess, is the, the shorthand version of that. I love it. I, I love it because uh, Rich in Relationship is founded on the principle that we are helping parents, whether they're together or apart, to have joyful and resilient lives so that their children are not collateral damage, their children <laughs> are not uh, put in the middle, but our front and center and also empowered to have joyful and resilient lives. And that sounds exactly like what you're talking about. Right. Yes, exactly. So try to try to help the kids live functional lives and, and break that cycle of dysfunction and trauma. Yeah. And how do we define trauma? And I'm, well, asking, that question, yeah. I'm asking that question because I think there's a lot of confusion around it. I think that right. societally, when we talk about trauma, people think about, uh, coming back from Vietnam, having burned villages or, you know, being, or there's their media images. Oh my God, bombs exploding all over the place. So every time you hear a car backfire, you're traumatized. But right. you know, I think, so I think the way the media presents trauma is we were always seeing the, the high end of it. But I think, and I think what people don't understand is what the full range of trauma is. 
Right. Well, the media presents it at, at, at both extremes. One is the extreme of the high trauma that you're talking about. And, and then our society likes to take that word and apply it to normal everyday stress and hurt feelings. And um, we talk about kids being traumatized by not being invited to a birthday party. Oh, yeah, well, It must be very traumatic. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, people say things like that, you know, yes, really, they do. and not realizing that maybe the word is being misapplied. Right, right, exactly. So I, I tend to be more of an evidence-based person. And so I looked to the, the, in the 1990s, there was a Kaiser Permanente study that looked at specific kinds of trauma and uh, uh, CDC and, and Kaiser Permanente did the study with tens of thousands of people and looking back in their past as children, they identified specific kinds of adverse childhood experiences mm -hmm. what, what is what they talk about. So those things that are covered in the ACEs study, such as having a parent who's incarcerated, losing a parent to death, um, divorce is one of the things that's mm -hmm. listed there. And then they traced the, the physical components of that. Now, that doesn't mean that every child who has suffered that is going to have those physical components. It was a very broad-based study, and it looked at broad-based trends. So I, I, I push back against the notion that a child who has been traumatized is is um, fated to have problems. They're at risk for problems, mm -hmm. and those are two very different things. There are some things that have not that were not studied in the ACES program, such as growing, um, spending time in a, in a war zone, um, cumulative impact of racism, those kinds of things that um, some have been studied, some we just sort of assume, like bullying. Um, there's not a lot of good studies on bullying because nobody quite knows what it is. Mm -hmm. And then there's a new phrase that we hear now called toxic stress, which it doesn't have a definition, doesn't have studies behind it. Oh, that's also toxic masculinity and toxic yes. masculinity. And interestingly, yes. they both mean kind of the same thing when you look at them. But so there's a lot of there's a lot of use in our culture right now of toxic and toxic. trauma. And I think that, that, you know, toxic is an applicable word, but I think it's not, I, I think a lot like trauma, it's not always apl applied appropriately. So we've got, no. all these, we've got all these words. How do we find our way through it? Well, that's why I like to look at the, the studies and the um, scientific uh, research studies. I, I can't I TikTok a walk. study. I know. It, well, see, that's the problem. That's that's part of the problem. And part of the problem, I think, as parents is we have to understand um, it, with psychological stress, and, and you will know, I'm treading on your territory here, but I, like I said, I'm a wonk and I love these studies. Um whenever we have, let's take the physical immune system, you know, we want our kids to be immune to measles. So we do it not by completely protecting them from measles, but by immunizing them, by giving their, by stressing their immune system. We know that kids who grow up in antiseptic environments are subject to a whole lot of physical problems because their immune system's not strong enough. We are starting to discover now that the psychological immune system, if you will, works the same way. Mm -hmm. If we protect our kids from all stress and from anything that hurts their feelings, and we call, talk about trauma from not being invited to birthday parties or not getting awards or any of those other things that we like to do in our self-esteem culture, then they don't develop the psychological immune system they need to deal with ordinary everyday stress. Makes perfect sense. I mean, you can't build resilience without some kind of challenge. And so if you are leading a very protected, insulated, unchallenged life, you know, you're, you, then you don't learn the lessons you need to meet yeah. life, which by definition, most of us recognize as challenging. Yes, exactly. And it's the hardest thing for us as parents to realize is that if we want our kids to be resilient, we have to step back and let them fail. Um, that doesn't mean we let them be unsafe, but, you know, I, kids who, who, children who never drive their tricycles into trees grow up into teenagers who drive their cars into trees mm -hmm. because they don't learn how the physical well, world sadly, works. I've done both of those things, but <laughs> Well, let's not talk about that. Right, uh, right. I just, uh, so, I'm, I'm a little more thick-headed than most kids. 
Right, maybe I right, like hitting right. trees. I'm not sure what it is. I, I, but you know, in later age, I've managed to not. <laughs> managed to do that. I've managed to keep the car on the road. Is the good news. But yeah, right, I understand right. what you're saying. You you got to learn the lessons at some point. Right, right. And the Perhaps earlier you learn them, yeah. But you know, will it's unlikely that we're all going to lead lives where we're into insulated and protected forever and ever. Amen. And so lessons are part of the game. Right, right. And if we want our kids to be resilient. Um, the sooner they they face moderate levels of stress, just like we don't drop our kids in a measles ward in order to to um, make them immune to measles, we don't we don't uh, uh, give them high levels of stress, things that no, are instead, actually traumatic. Instead, we give them a vaccine which has measles yes. in it, and the body right. experiences a low level a reaction to measles, which teaches it to, to fight it off when it they're actually exposed to it. Yeah, same exactly. principle. I I love it. And um, so what we're talking about here, folks, are it's, there's trauma in general, but really specifically, you know, we've, we're talking about what happens when children are being raised not in their family of origin or perhaps in a blended family where there's one member from their family of origin and how, what does trauma have to do with that? And so I'm going to ask you, Debbie, what does, what does trauma have to do with blended families? Well, because, uh, and this we do have scientific studies from children of divorce face a lot of problems that, uh, again, there are at risk for a lot of problems that children from intact biological families don't face. And mm -hmm. divorce was one of the issues, uh, one of the things studied in that, in that groundbreaking ACEs study. So, and we have to understand from, from our kids' perspective, they have lost their intact family, either through death or divorce. Mm -hmm. And that from from their perspective is as much as they love us if we have a good relationship with them we're still not the people who are supposed to be there mm -hmm. and one illustration i use with this my my younger stepson and i um we, we uh, he's an adult now and we adore each other and and have from the day we met but shortly after my husband got married his wife asked for custody he had custody at the time his, his ex-wife asked for custody and we were trying to find out from our younger son what his opinion was. And, and he was resisting because he, he didn't want to take sides. And we weren't wanting him to take sides. We just didn't want to go down a path that he was completely opposed to it. And my husband said, well, let me ask you this way. If you had a magic wand, what would the situation look like? And uh, my stepson didn't hesitate. He just said immediately, well, if I had a magic wand, you and mom would be back together. Uh -huh. And and then he paused and he looked at me very anxiously and said, I, no insult, Debbie, you, you and the dogs would be right next door. And <laughs> so, That's very sweet. And it, it was very sweet, but it was also very true. These kids, if they had their choice, we would be in, assuming we have a good relationship with them, we would be in their lives as a soccer coach, as a neighbor, as a person who bakes them cookies, as a mentor, but their parents would still be together. Yeah, this, so and, there's a lot There's a lot in that. I mean, and I often tell this to people that I'm working with who are getting divorced is uh, they say, how, how do we break this to our children? And I say to them, listen, you need to understand that, first of all, no matter how long you're separated or even after you get remarried, your children will secretly hope that you're going to get that, get back together. Yes. Even if they consciously realize that that's insane, that your marriage was horrible, they still un unconsciously, irrationally always want their parents to be together. Second thing you need to realize is that they feel responsible. And part of yes. why they want you together is they feel responsible. It's completely insane. Of course, they 99.9% .9 of the time, I can't even think of children who actually do have something to do with it, but it's possible that there's a child who drove a divorce yeah. out there somewhere. So I'm going to leave it out there as a possibility, yeah. but I've never heard of it, but they, you yeah. know, they feel responsible. And so then the divorce goes through uh, and here's this child who secretly or maybe not so secretly wants their parents to get back together they feel responsible for the divorce and then what do you do you go and marry somebody else and so this child is now this child who didn't want you to marry somebody else is now in this situation and i remember what my stepson one of the first things he said to me was and his father too by the way was you are not my father and his father reminded yeah. me you are not his father and <clears throat> you know that was 
just the tip of the iceberg because under that is not only you're not my father, but I really don't want to live with you. Not because you're a bad guy or a good guy, but because really what I want is for my mom and dad to get back together. So there's so much packed into yes. not the people who we are, who are supposed to be there. There's so much packed into that. Yes. How do you yes. dissect that, take it apart, work with it, uh, help, help, you know, help with the trauma? Well, you just recognize their world is out of kilter. And and fortunately, I was before I was a step parent, I was a foster parent. So I had heard from these kids, you're not my mom. I don't want to be here um, or, or with varying degrees of politeness. And, and I learned to say, I, I know I, and I'm sorry. I'm 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 I, I, and to be genuinely sorry that they were in the situation they were in and to say we are where we are. I care about you. I love you no matter what you think. And these are the house rules. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out ways to say all of those things at different times um, because you, you have to accept the fact that their world is out of kilter and you mm -hmm. cannot fix that and you never will be able to fix that. And they, they, you have they, to, they need to find that inner balance themselves yes, between yes. What, what they irrationally want and what's actually happening. It's, and there's right. uh, step parents. Actually, we have very little that we can do in regard to that other than make it OK. Other than make it OK, give them space and and love them anyway. Yeah. And that's the biggest part for us is to love them unconditionally when they're obnoxious, when they don't want us there, when they're You're actively working to, uh, yeah. or, or actively sabotaging the second marriage that they yeah. don't want. Um, you know, better than I do, the statistics for second marriage are what, like 70% of them fall apart or yeah, something it's terrible. Pretty, it's pretty bad. And, and the biggest flashpoint seems to be kids most of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so you just, I, I call it, um, being like gravity <laughs> because if you think about it you know the kids can deny the law of gravity we all can pretend because we don't like the law of gravity but it's still there it's there and sometimes it's we're there. really glad it's there right right like, i don't want to um, spin off the planet no no <laughs> and we um and we take it for granted i don't like what it's doing to all this you know yes over time oh, oh definitely definitely and for those of you who are um, listening i'm touching my face while i say you know gravity that. works on our body continuously that's right but no matter what we think about it it is still there it's not it's not in our face it's not making demands on us it's not um it's just there in the background being what it is and that's what we have to do we just have to be there and um and and let them bounce off of us it sounds know? sounds like what you're saying is even though we're not the people who are supposed to be there we are the people who are there we are there and as long as we can make it safe for them and okay for them and let them know that we are there not just that we're present uh physically but present emotionally for them when they choose to let us in then when they we, that will go a long way to helping this child to resolve their irrational feelings, their the trauma that they've experienced through the divorce or whatever else is going on in their lives. Right. First thing, they have to feel safe with us. And they're never going to like us and trust us until they feel safe with us. Mm. And and the other thing we have to realize is it, it doesn't come from just words. Um, early in my marriage, my, my younger son, I, he would say things that I realized he was... One night, as I was tucking him in at night, he, he he said he had been thinking about this. I could tell. He said, Debbie, when you and dad break up, and I said, we're, we're not going to be breaking up. He said, okay, whatever. If you break up, uh, can I come live with you? <laughs> and, and I, was, I, 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 I was very flattered. And said, I want to come course, live with you too, if I'm honest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I realized he just expected marriages to break up. And he was well, trying to make a plan. Sense. It makes perfect yes. sense. What's their experience? Yes. That's, and that's the other and, thing is we go, we go into these, we launch into these new families and what we're declaring is don't worry this time, it'll be different. Right. You know, when right. when the statistics will tell them, maybe not, maybe their not experience says, no, it won't be. definitely not. And I, so I asked him, I, it was, he's, like I said, he's an adult now. And I asked a couple of years ago when he quit worrying about that, and why he quit worrying. And he thought about it and he said, well, you're still here. 
And, you know, that was the only thing that reassured him was just watching me still be there. And it takes time. You just have to wait it out. And w one quick question. I know we've gone a little over, but this is really good. Um, <laughs> one quick question, though, and I think this is important. It's something we talked about before we started the show is what is really the difference maker here? What do the when two people get together and start a blended family, where does their focus need to be? It has to be on the marriage. Um, I, I I think that, uh, and obviously we're talking within parameters of safe relationships, mm -hmm. the, the 80, 85 percent of ordinary relationships. I'm not talking about abusive or toxic yes. relationships, uh, but but after it has to be the marriage because if we do our jobs right, the the kids will be gone, and they won't need us. Um, we're in this for what two decades tops. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like my marriage to last longer than that, number one. And number two, kids need to see a relationship that lasts and they need to see it from the inside. If they are ever going to have a shot at, at having a functional life and lasting relationships that they can trust and they can depend on, they have to experience it and they have to see it. And we're going to be the only people who can show that to them. Let me throw some more kindling on that fire, if that's okay. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. You know, something that a lot of the work that we do with folks who are in divorce or in tough marriages is we help them to reprioritize their lives so that number one, they're taking care of themselves as individuals. And, and this isn't about love. This is about what needs to happen. And the, ra the reason is you can't, if your battery is never fully charged, then you yes. can't really fully show up. So we, we right. teach them, number one, to take care of themselves as individuals, to set aspirations for themselves mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, you know, and to and to make sure that they're sleeping and taking care of themselves, all that good stuff. And then number two, we 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 strongly suggest that they put their relationship next because there is a synergy that happens when two people are working together that isn't the same as when two people are parallel parenting under right. the same roof. Uh, actually, we like to call it, um, not parallel parenting under the same roof, we like to call it leading parallel lives. You mm -hmm. know? And so, and that, that it, it's norm actually normal and natural for people to slip into leading parallel lives oh, yeah. at some point because you know, you, you're each leaning into your own strengths and uh, you're taking care of your, the areas that you're best at. But the danger always is that you're if you're neglecting the relationship itself, it's you forget that the relationship needs to be nurtured and fed. And it's and it's the communication and the basis of that relationship where the synergy happens and where more is going to be generated than if it's just the two of you operating side by side. Uh, and yes, then we definitely. tell them next. Fo yeah. Focus on the kids, because if you're both on the same if you're on the same track, if you're taking if you're charging your own battery and you've got a, uh, an action plan together and you're leaning into your strengths and your synergies, you know, then the, you're going to lift the kids even higher. Uh, but right. the tendency right. uh, in the pandemic is we would get these folks who would, I get these folks who are like, oh, my God, I can't go to work. I'm at home. My kids are here at school. What do I do? Uh, and, and their priorities would be they'd be taking care of the kids first uh, or, yes. or maybe they'd be taking care of work first. You know, yes. and the kids second, but it would usually be one of those two kids and work would be up there on top. Then they'd be taking care of themselves last and their relationship would fall off the grid. And that's why everything was going bonkers in their lives. And when they re prioritized my time first, our time second, kids third work, they always got work done when they had those yes. other three things taken care of. They're like, oh my God, this, yeah, I, I always get my work done when those other things are in place. And then their lives worked, you know, again, if that works in crisis and that works in day-to-day -day life. Well, it works. The other thing that, that I've discovered is when my family life is in crisis, I, I cannot concentrate on my work. Yeah. And I, I may be saying I'm putting my work first, but I, I'm only one third there, if that. Right. Uh, you're, you're and I, and I'm making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Yeah, you go. They're going through those. You're thinking, God, I wonder if Tom's okay, and you know, or right. maybe, or maybe Joanna's going to flunk out of school, or whatever. You know, whatever's going on in the background. Hey, Debbie, how can people find you and your book, raising other people's children? Well, I think probably the easiest way is uh, just go to raisingotherpeopleschildren.com. That's the um, the website for my book, and it has links to my blog and to uh, my website. 
Um, my website is debbieosborn.com, but you have to know how to spell Osborne. So <laughs> either one of those. A-U-S-B-U-R-N. A-U-S-B-U-R-N. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And it'll be in the, this will be, excuse me, be in the notes for the podcast and the video blog. So you can look it all up there too. But also you can just Google De Debbie Osborne. You could even mess up the spelling of her name and you'll still find her pretty well. She comes up pretty high <laughs> on Google. So someone's doing a good job over there in keeping oh, your you. Google rankings up because I did that. Well, thank you. That's good. That's good to know. So, um, and, and people can sign up for my blog. They get a newsletter. I send it out once a week of posts on my blog, or they can just follow my blog. Got it. And the question I ask everyone when we get to the end, and I, I, I'm always sad when we get to the end, I'm learning how to do endings better is what's happening there, <laughs> is what is the legacy you want to leave behind? Children who have been able to recover from their trauma and develop resilience. Mm, love it. I love it. I, I, in a world where children recover from their trauma and develop resilience, you've got the potential to end this, uh, this generational pattern that's been going right. on from, from generation to generation and start creating something really special and new. Love it. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for this time. I've really enjoyed you. I love this topic. And maybe we can do this again sometime. I would love to. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you.